This morning, we're going to take a little break from Matthew. Stretch out a little bit, take a breather. We've been going through the book of Matthew as a church. We started this year. Uh, just went through the Sermon on the Mount, the commands in it. Jesus kind of raises the bar, feels like he maybe also beats us with it a little bit, right? It was tough, but we got through it. It's good, though, because it helps us see just that, you know, the Beatitudes begin, blessed are the poor in spirit. And something like that helps us really feel how poor in spirit we actually are. And so we're going to put Matthew on pause, though, and we're going to take a couple weeks here to do something a little bit different. Now, I'm not a huge mission statement kind of guy. Uh, it seems like most companies, most organizations, they have mission statements, and they always seem a little cheesy to me. I don't know about you. I've got a real high like detector for that kind of stuff. Deep down, I'm just I'm not a hype guy. I'm not a marketing guy. Uh, I'm I'm sensitive to jargon. Somebody's throwing it that throwing it throwing that my way. I just kind of tuned out. Uh, Lakeside has, since it was founded, at least to my knowledge, had one mission statement. Now, how many of you would be able to recite that word for word? None of you, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, I had to look it up for this this morning. This is what it has been. Do whatever it takes to help those far from God come into a relationship with and become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Now, that's certainly a good thing. Absolutely. And that is accurate in expressing what we feel God has called us to here at Lakeside. But if I'm honest, it feels a little bit clunky to me. It feels like one of those mission statements that I'm talking about. Uh, it's kind of hard to remember that. It doesn't exactly fit on a t-shirt, right? <laughs> and so the elders and I, we've been in this mode of reevaluating things this year. Uh, we've been looking at kind of where we're at and where we see Lakeside headed, where we'd like it to go. And we've been thinking about a lot of things and rethinking a lot of things. One of those was that mission statement. And so we've changed it. We have a new mission statement here at Lakeside Community Church, and it's one I'm pretty excited about. And this is it. Adore Jesus, make disciples. <laughs> That's it. Adore Jesus, make disciples. Fits on a t-shirt. It, uh, it, it will probably be a window decal or something out in the lobby. I haven't figured out exactly what yet. But it's memorable. Not going to forget that. What do we do? Door Jesus, make disciples. What I love about it, too, is that it's both the why and the how. What do we do? We adore Jesus, we make disciples. Well, how do we do that? Well, we adore Jesus and we make disciples. <laughs> That's something I feel like you can easily sort of rally around. And so what we're going to do for the next two weeks is we're going to take that statement apart and get into, well, what is this all about? What are we called to do here as a church? Why are we meeting? What is this for? Sometimes I feel like we can get into this pattern where we just sort of go through the motions at church, and we don't really think about why we're doing what we've been doing. And so I want to take these two weeks, just kind of give us a little vision check there. Put your shades on, and we'll go through and, uh, and take a look at this, right? Now, there's an old story that pops up from time to time uh, in a few different forms, and it goes something like this, that there's this wife that is making roast for her new husband, and as she goes to put the roast in the pan, she cuts the ends off, puts the roast in the pan, puts it in the oven, and the husband is like, why did you cut the ends off? That's like the best part of the roast. It's like, what are you doing? She says, well, that's the way my mom's always done it. We cut the ends off, and then we put it in the pan, and then we put it in the oven. And so he's kind of puzzled by that, and she doesn't really know why. And so their parents come, her parents come over for dinner, and so she asks her mom, Mom, why do we cut the ends off the roast when we put it in the pan? And the husband's kind of like, what's up with this? And she goes, you know, that's just the way my mom's always done it. <laughs> and so I never, that's just what we do. And so she goes, okay, well, I'm going to have to ask Grandma. So eventually they get over to the grandparents' house, and so she, the woman asks her Grandma, Grandma, when we make the roast, why do we cut the ends off when we put it in the pan? And she says, well, look at my pans. That's the only way I can get it to fit. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And sometimes I think we can kind of do that as a church where we just keep doing things that have been passed down to us, but we don't necessarily remember why we're doing them or what they're all about. So I want to take this little two-part series and we're going to break down that statement one by one uh, and unpack it. And so this week, we'll cover the first part, adore Jesus. Now, when I say adore Jesus, of course, I'm talking about worship. But, well, what is worship? Why do we do it? And so first of all, the first thing, if you know anything about worship, what worship is is a response to God. This is what Paul says in Romans 12.1. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, normally I roll with the ESV. But they've made a little tweak to this verse that I don't, I think obscures what Paul's actually trying to say here. He uses the word dia, and they translate it as by, so by the mercies of God. And it sounds like what Paul's saying is that his appeal is coming by the mercies of God. Well, I don't really think that's what he means here. I think the NIV gets this one a lot better. They translate it, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So you see the change there. It's not Paul's appeal that is by the mercies of God. He's saying, in view of God's mercy, thinking about what God has done for us, because of that, this is how we respond to that. We respond as, by offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. This is the way that we worship him. And this is consistent with the rest of the Bible. The rest of the Bible goes through and it talks about how worship always starts with God. It is always a response to him. Moses is a great example of this in Exodus. In Exodus 33, Moses said, please show me your glory. And so he's asking God, show me your glory. He wants to see God as clearly as he possibly can and so what does God do? He obliges. This is what happens in Exodus 34. It says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord of merciful and great, is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So God descends at a cloud. He obscures himself a little bit, but he gives Moses as clear a picture as he can possibly get of him. He lays out his character and his power. Moses has this incredible experience. And what does Moses do? And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Moses worships in response to who God is. Why? Because worship always starts with God. It starts with who he is and it starts with what he's done. Those are both important pieces there. When you get sight of who God is, the natural response is worship. When you get an understanding of what he's done, the natural response is worship. So let's zoom in first on who he is. There's this word that gets used to describe him all throughout Scripture. It's splendor. The splendor of God is this call to worship because of how magnificent he is. If we don't feel compelled to worship, it might be that we've become numb to how magnificent God truly is. I think the antidote for that is digging into our Bibles. When we read through the Bible, we get a picture of who God is. This is one of many reasons why it's so important to spend time in the Word for yourself. The Psalms, for example, they're just chock full of beautiful word pictures about God, about who He is. And so we're going to go through some of these rapid fire. If you have a Bible with you, don't try turning the pages. Just listen to what I'm saying because we're going to go quick here. Maybe one or two of these are going to capture your imagination. In Psalm 29, 2, it says, 
Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Psalm 76, glorious are you, more majestic than the mountains full of prey. The stout-hearted were stripped of their spoil. They sank into sleep. All the men of war were unable to use their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse lay stunned. Psalm 97, the mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens Proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Psalm 100, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Think about some of that. When we find our woe of God or our awe of God waning, the antidote is to meditate on the word. To get in there and think about who he is and what he's done. And the Psalms are a great place to go for that. I mean, shoot, let's just go to Psalm 1. We'll just start at the very beginning of the book, right? It goes like this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. For starters, we're encouraged explicitly to meditate on Scripture here by the psalmist. But then look what it says at the end here. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Think about what that means. Just that one phrase from this first psalm. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. That means that nothing has caught him by surprise. There is nothing that you can go through that he is not already aware of and that he is not in control over. There's nothing. Meditate that. Let that sink in. That he is in control. We are on a path that he knows every nook and cranny of, every twist and turn. You find the awe of God. Just think on that. Just go back to that. Day after day. You don't have to make progress necessarily reading your Bible. You can read Psalm 1 for a week. Just go back to it. Just read it over and over and over until it really sinks in and gets in there. The beauty of God compels us to worship Him. But not just the beauty of God, but also the beauty of the gospel is compelling as well. After all, the phrases adore Jesus specifically, right? Now, my favorite passage to go to for this is in Colossians chapter 1. This is absolutely beautiful. It's full of good stuff about Jesus. This is how it goes, starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now we've got to break this down piece by piece because there is so much happening in this one paragraph. So let's go back through. First, he is the image of the invisible God. 
If you want to know what God is like, look no farther than Jesus. God is invisible. We can't see him. Atheists joke like, well, I don't believe in some man in the sky. Cool. Me neither. That's not the God of the Bible. He is invisible. He is spirit. But God reveals himself to us in Jesus. People could see Jesus. They could touch him. They knew what he was like. They knew what he sounded like. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Then it says, by him all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. By, through, for. Everything is about Jesus. Everything. Me, you, corgis, tomatoes, <laughs> mountains, waves, stars, trees, jalapenos, all of it. Made by Jesus. He's the source of everything. Made through Jesus. He's the how of creation. God speaks through Jesus and creates everything. And everything is made for Jesus. He is the end goal. He is the point of all of this. By, through, for. It says, and He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. This tells us that He existed before everything. He was not created Jesus is God. He has existed before everything. And He didn't just create everything and then walk away from it. He's holding it together. He's active in it. Deists believe that God creates the universe and sends it off like a top, spinning on its own. That they don't really have, He doesn't have anything to do with it anymore. But that's not what Jesus does. He creates the universe and He's active in it. He's holding it together. He's overseeing and maintaining everything that He's created. He cares for, He watches over His creation. He is the head of the body, the church. When we're in the church, when we put our faith in Jesus, we are part of Him. We're part of His very body. God looks at us and He sees Jesus. And He's leading us. He's bringing us along. Being the head means being the leader. So we're part of Jesus and He's showing us the way. He's leading us well. And He is the beginning. That in everything He would be preeminent. Jesus is the most important thing. He's preeminent above everything. Preeminent means above and beyond anyone else. So if you're the preeminent expert on guacamole, you know more about guacamole than any person that lives. You are the guacamole king, right? It says Jesus is preeminent above everything. Nothing above Him, nothing past Him. He's above it all. Did you guys see uh, this Katie Ledecky race in the Olympics? Uh, she's a swimmer for the U.S. She won gold in the 200-meter, 400-meter, 800-meter freestyles, as well as the 4x200-meter relay. But the 800-meter is what was insane to watch. She beat the world record, which she previously set, by two full seconds. That in and of itself is insane. But then you start looking at her times, and of the best performances in that race all time, she has the top 13. 13 of the top performances in all time. There's an old rap song that was like, I'm not saying I'm number one. No, I lied. I'm number one, two, three, four, and five. <laughs> and Katie Ledecky is one, two, three, four, and five, and six, and seven, and eight, and nine, and ten, and eleven, and twelve, and thirteen. That's insane. She beat the silver medalist by 11 and a half seconds. That's enough time to win the gold medal and then tweet about the winning the gold medal <laughs> before second place finishes. And you look at the photos of the race and it's crazy because it looks like she's in the pool by herself. There's no one else in the photo. They're like, oh, we're going to take a picture of Katie. And no one. 
There's another photo where you see everyone going towards this way, and she's already like here. <laughs> a performance like that, it's amazing. One, yeah, because you just see what human potential can do. But it's also a great reflection of a deeper truth here. As far as Katie is from all of the other swimmers in that race, Jesus is even farther removed from anything that could possibly challenge him for importance. He's number one by miles. I'm not talking about swimming. That wouldn't be fair anyway, because he could just run across the top of the pool. But <laughs> but he's first and foremost above everything. That's how important, how grand he is. And then Paul says, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So all of God's beauty, all of God's glory, it's all visible in Jesus. Everything we read in the Psalms, everything we want to, all of that lives in Jesus. You see all of it in him. The to reconcile to himself all things, making peace by the blood of his cross. The sacrifice Jesus makes on the cross is big enough for everyone and everything. Thing. That he's made peace with God on our behalf and on the behalf of all things. Nothing is left out of all things. All things. It's big enough, it's grand enough for everyone forever. And so the absolute just wonder and beauty of what Jesus has done for us, it's stunning here. This is the most important thing we could dedicate ourselves to. I read that chapter and I'm always just floored. Like that's something I can get excited about every single time. And so this is why our mission as a church is to adore Jesus. Because every, everything God does is for His glory. It is the most important thing. It's the reason He creates the universe. He creates the universe because He wants to share His love, His goodness, all of His perfect qualities. He wants to share them with us. He wants to spread it around. And that is His glory. And so when we recognize, when we respond to that glory, we're engaging in the highest good we possibly can. There's an old church catechism that nails this. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to enjoy God and glorify Him forever. Ultimately, worship is worth-ship. And literally, that's where the word comes from. At some point, we just threw the TH out of there. But it comes from this idea of worth-ship, ascribing worth to something. And so when we worship God, what it's about is giving Him His proper place and His proper worth. And so worship isn't about what we get out of it. It's about what we put into it. It's not about feeling like we walked away receiving something. It's did we or did we not give something to the Lord? It's always about Him. And so now that we've talked about the why, let's talk a little bit about the how. And Jesus talks about this a bit in John's Gospel. A woman asks him, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is, where, is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You will worship, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman at the well comes to Jesus and she wants to ask logistical questions. So are we supposed to worship over here? Are we supposed to worship over there? What's going on with that? And Jesus makes that question completely irrelevant. Like first, God is spirit. Again, he's invisible. He's not tangible. He's unknowable unless he makes himself known. That's exactly what he's done through Jesus and through Scripture. And so when we're in Christ, we're born in the spirit. We have this new spiritual life in Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. We enter into the same kind of life that God enjoys. 
And so worshiping God in spirit and in truth looks like this. One, it's God-centered, right? Remember, it's always in response to him. It's always about him. And it's made possible through the Holy Spirit that we now have with this new spiritual life we have. And it's in conformity with God's revelation in Jesus and in Scripture. So on a Sunday morning, this looks a few different ways. The first is singing. And now there are some scriptural reasons for this. In Colossians 3, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing song, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Paul mentions specifically singing is something that the people of God do when they get together. And it gets looped in with thankfulness. You can see there. The overflow of the heart in response to what God has done is expressed in song. There's a picture of this in Ephesians, which is kind of a strange verse to go to, but look what it says here. It says, And do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that may seem like a weird passage to go to, uh, but check out what he's saying here. That we normally go to this passage when we're saying, you know, oh, well, you shouldn't get drunk. But that's only half the passage. That's the negative half. There's a positive half of it here. That being filled with the Spirit results in praise. It results in thankfulness, songs of thankfulness. Paul's not just saying, don't escape through booze. He's saying, don't escape through booze. Get lost in thankfulness for God. Lose yourself in Jesus. And so singing is something that we're called to do, and it's something the people of God have done for thousands of of years. We went through all those psalms earlier. Musical celebration was part of the way that God was worshipped by Israel. And the New Testament church, that pattern continues. We see it in Scripture. We see it in other writings. There's a famous letter from one Roman ruler to another. And he's done some covert ops on these Christians to figure out what they're all about. And he marks out that and they're singing songs of praise to Jesus as God. It goes all the way back to the earliest days of the church. There's plenty of good scriptural and historical reasons to sing as worship. There's some good practical reasons, too. Number one, singing helps us remember things. You probably learned many things as a child through song. The alphabet, right? I can't even still today think of the alphabet without putting it to the tune of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, right? The only hope I ever have of naming all 50 states is by trying to remember the song, right? Alabama, Alaska, Arizona. Like, <laughs> what singing does is it helps us remember the truths of Scripture. It helps us remember theology. Maybe some of the passages we've gone to today have sounded familiar because they've been in songs that we sing here on Sunday mornings. That's why we sing the kinds of songs that we do here. I've been really proud of John and of our other band leaders for the way that they choose songs to sing. It's always solid theology with a high view of Jesus. Why? Because it com that's what we want to communicate and that's what we need to get into our brains and into our hearts. We sing those songs because they help us adore Jesus, but we also sing those songs because they're good theology to know. The second reason, singing engages our emotions. Our emotions are another means by which we can connect with God. We don't have to be afraid of having our emotions engaged in worship. We certainly we don't want our emotions to take over. We don't want to be slaves to them. We don't want that to be the only thing that is stirred. Well, worship should stir our emotions. That's why it's good, too, to sing some songs that aren't always super positive. We sang one a couple weeks ago while I was on the band that it's basically a lament. 
It comes from someone who attended Lakeside when they lived here, and they were going through a difficult time, and they wrote those words. And John helped them put music to it, and it became that song. It is good and it is right to engage all of our emotions and worship and not just stir up happiness. It's healthy to bring our sorrow, to bring our frustrations to the Lord. You look at the kinds of songs that Israel sings in all of the Psalms, and you get this broad picture. You see them, they're like, you sang this in church, y'all? Like, I would feel weird saying this in church. Like, you're singing about wanting your enemies, kids to get beat up and stuff? Like, wow. They're bringing that emotion and they're giving it to God. It's healthy. Singing also helps unite us. We're having this experience together. We're all joining together. We're all experiencing God in one way all at once. When we worship together, what we're doing is we're tuning our hearts to the same frequency. We're getting on the same page collectively as a church as we recenter ourselves around Jesus. That's the point of this meeting on Sundays, is to recenter the church around the head, Jesus. And when we do that through song, we recalibrate ourselves together. And now, singing isn't the only way that we worship on Sundays. Preaching is also part of the way that we worship on Sundays. Worship isn't just about singing. Worship continues into this part of the service as well. Look at this passage in 2 Timothy. Part of this will be familiar, but most people stop. We're going to keep going. It says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and and by His appearing and His kingdom, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Now, it's true that all Scripture is good for teaching, training, etc. And we'll probably come back to this next week as we talk about the make disciples part. But that's not all it's good for. Paul uses this word, preach. Now, we think of preaching and we have an idea of what that word means. We think of it as like you're badgering someone, right? Like if someone's really heavy-handed, like beating you up, you say, well, hey, man, don't be so preachy, right? That sort of negative connotation it has for us is the reason that we in church really don't use that word a whole lot, right? We always talk about this is the message, it's not the sermon, right? Because we don't want that negative connotation to come with it. But the sad thing is is that it's a really important word that Paul uses here. When he uses it, it's not about pestering people. Better synonyms would be herald, announce, proclaim. When I or anyone else who's up here preaching on a Sunday morning, what we're doing is we're proclaiming. We're announcing what God has done. We're celebrating who He is. When this happens, the Holy Spirit is active and moving. The heralding of the gospel is spiritual. It's not just educational. And so what this does is it rallies us around Jesus. I try to run my messages through a filter. If Jesus never rose from the dead, would this message still be applicable? If the answer is yes, it's a message I probably don't preach. Because it might be good advice, but that's not what we're here for. It might be helpful, but that's not what we're supposed to be doing right now. It should elevate the name of Jesus, and it should center us all around who He is and what He's done. That's what preaching should do, and that's why preaching is worshipful. Giving is another way that we worship on Sunday. We worship through giving, whether that's our tithes and offerings out of what God has blessed us with. Maybe that's our time and talent serving on a ministry team. However we give, whatever we give, it's worship. In Hebrews, the author says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. What's worshipful? Doing good and sharing what you have. When you make sacrifices, this is, they're worship. They're pleasing to God. So instead of 
bringing in a lamb on Sunday morning, you can hand out bulletins or run ProPresenter, right? Which, personally, I think is way preferable. When we follow God's lead and generosity, it's worship. That's partly why we've moved the offering into the middle of the singing now, is to communicate that idea that, hey, this is worship too. And not just our singing, not just our preaching, not just our giving, but our entire lives are meant to be worship. And Colossians 3, 17, says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We're to do everything in Jesus' name. When you do something in someone's name, you're doing it as a representative of them. And here Paul says, do everything. Everything should be done out of thankfulness to God. Back to Romans. I appeal to you by the mercies of God. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So because of God's mercy, what are we to do? We're to offer our whole lives as a sacrifice to Him. Everything is an opportunity for worship. We're to be walking sacrifices, just walking around and giving worship back to God. Everything we do is an opportunity for worship. That means when we're working, it's worship. When we're eating, it's worship. When we're walking through nature, it's worship. At least it should be. It isn't automatically, but insofar as we are intentionally giving thanks to God as we're doing that, as long as we're appreciating Jesus in it, it's worship. I've talked about this in great lengths in regard to food in the past, right? Last night, my in-laws are in town, we made some steaks for dinner. It was a worshipful event for me. <laughs> when we direct our thankfulness to God for all He's given us, and we enjoy it as a gift from Him, that's an opportunity for worship. And so the highest calling we have as a church here is to adore Jesus. That's what it means to live out the greatest commandment, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. It's this. And we do it as a response to Him. That's why we, we've reorganized this service the way that we have. Maybe it's your first time here and you're like, we only did like one song and now we're already singing. Like, what is going on? Well, we're going to sing more after because we're going to open God's Word and proclaim what He's done, recenter it, and then we're going to celebrate that together. We're going to respond to that with singing. We've engineered the service in that way to communicate this idea. Worship is something we do collectively, and it's something we do individually as we leave here. We go out, and the worship keeps going. It seeps into our work. It seeps into our play. It seeps into our rest. And so our mission as a church is to do this well, to make much of Jesus, to adore Him, Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are and what you've done. Lord, I pray that you would capture our hearts and minds and imaginations, that we would have such a clear picture of your splendor, your grandeur, your glory. That it would get in there deep into our hearts, deep into our minds. And that we would respond to that with lives of worship. Bring this back to our memory as we go about the rest of our week, as we work, as we play, as we rest. That in all things, we would give thanks and bring glory to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.